Today we are talking about appropriation. This is a hotbed topic that I'm really asking each of you to uh, kind of come up with your own understanding of and, and where you think it is okay and where you and maybe sometimes you don't think it's okay. Um, but I just want to emphasize that there is no kind of directive from this class of how you need to feel about this topic other than that I'm asking you to uh, come up with that on your own. So the uh, kind of Tate modern definition here of appropriation is appropriation in art in our history refers to the practice of artists using pre-existing objects or images in their art with little transformation of the original. Um, we're gonna start by watching a quick video from the art assignment. As you've all learned, it's one of my favorite um, video resources and then we're going to just kind of look through uh, at, at some more work uh, that is uh, appropriation work in, in uh, history and contemporary art. This is a photograph by Walker Evans. And this is a photograph by Sherry Levine. Walker Evans' photograph dates from 1936, when he was hired by the Farm Security Administration to document the American South in the wake of the Great Depression. Sherry Levine's was taken in 1981 from a reproduction of the Evans photograph as part of a series titled, Yes, After Walker Evans. Credit where credit is due, but if forgery is not at issue here, what is? Evans' photographs are iconic and indisputable documents of a depression. They show us its face. But what exactly do Levine's photographs show us. Recent art is full of copying of all kinds and degrees. Art that borrows, steals, pilfers, or poaches existing images. Some of them iconic, others not. Are these confessions of creative inadequacy? Bald opportunism masquerading as concept? Are these cries for help as we drown in an image-saturated world? Or the death rattle of the great pictorial tradition? How are we supposed to distinguish this kind of copying from a long history of art full of illusions, influences, and innumerable instances of of visual sampling, long before hip hop spread the sonic version of it coast to coast. A sample, after all, is just one part of a whole song. But what if the copy is the artwork? This is the case for copying. Artists, of course, have been copying since time immemorial. In fact, the earliest Western traditions of aesthetic thought defined art as mimesis, or imitation of the visible world. But artists don't just imitate the world, they imitate each other, copying in order to train their hand or demonstrate stylistic innovation. They copy to signal the influence of other artworks, to claim the prestige of a particular heritage, or to rework a stock artistic subject for their own time. Working from existing imagery and traditions can also suggest new ways to navigate history. Raphael's into portrait of Pope Julius II became a model for Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X, which in turn inspired Francis Bacon to make over 45 versions of his own, each portrait transgressive in its own time for how it exposed psychological depths of the man at the seat of the church's power. Velazquez's Las Meninas was also metabolized by Pablo Picasso, who additionally made numerous versions of Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, painted by Edward Manet in 1863. Manet's Déjeuner, in turn, borrowed its composition from a Raymond the engraving of Raphael's Judgment of Paris and its subject from the Concert Champetre. But it's Manet's old musician that establishes him as the modernist mix master. Though it might look like a genre painting, the old musician is in fact a composite image with an extravagant number of citations, a painted phrase, as the art historian Carol Armstrong called it, that reads, after Watteau, after myself and Murillo, after Lenin and Velasquez, and so on. Manet's painting is not a window onto another reality, but a cluster of representations, each one like a song that can be sampled again and again. Manet's mashup, moreover, stares back at us. The old musician personifies the way that all pictures, so to speak, regard us. Images aren't just neutral depictions of the world. They're instruments influencing how we perceive ourselves and others. This awareness inspired a number of artists in the late 1970s to make art that foregrounded representation itself. Art historians refer to this work as appropriation art. In 1977, art critic Donald Crimp curated an exhibition titled Pictures, bringing together artists who shared an interest in understanding the picture itself. Artists of the pictures generation, as they came to be called, plundered existing images for their own work. Jack Goldstein's film Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer loops the familiar MGM lion's roar, 
suspending us between the pleasure of anticipation and the frustrating deferral of the feature film. Dara Birnbaum's technology transformation Wonder Woman fragments and repeats clips from the TV series to draw out the relationship between technology and sexual objectification. By isolating and manipulating images, these artists direct our attention toward their subtext and demonstrate how they get their meanings, not through our actual experience with lions or superheroes, but through our associations with other pictures like them. In her series of film stills, Cindy Sherman photographed herself in the poses and scenarios of generic feminine personas that evoked stock narratives, so that each version of Sherman seems overdetermined from the start by our expectations for her. As Crimp wrote, we are not in search of sources or origins, but of structures of signification. Underneath each picture, there is always another picture. These artists certainly weren't the first to use images from pop culture. The aptly named pop art movement built upon the work of artists including Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, who made bronze casts of mass-produced objects or incorporated newsprint and rubbish into their work. Art historian Leo Steinberg described this work as belonging to the flatbed picture plane, borrowing the term from the flatbed printing press that had flooded the post-war world with mass media images. As Steinberg saw it, paintings were no longer doorways to imaginary worlds, evoking our visual experience. They were like tabletops strewn with papers and objects that simulated how we look at pictures in newspapers and magazines. Not incidentally, Andy Warhol began his career in advertising. Warhol explained that he chose the subjects of his paintings, from commercial products to celebrities, precisely because everyone already liked them. The artist's job, so Warhol claimed, was not to offer up new images of beauty, but to reproduce what society had already approved. This authorized him to appropriate images of mass-produced objects and to turn them out in the studio he called the factory, blurring the distinctions between artist and factory worker and between commodity and art. In more recent years, Richard Prince, who may sit atop the high throne of copydom, described his interest in copying this way. Advertising images aren't associated with an author. They look like they have no history to them, like they showed up all at once. They look like what art always wants to look like. Yet, of course, Prince Warhol and other pop artists certainly didn't fade into the woodwork. On the contrary, a Campbell's soup can is almost synonymous with the name Warhol, a single blown-up cartoon frame with Roy Lichtenstein. Pop art held up a mirror to the ubiquity of mass media, but a mirror is often the weakest form of critique. After all that other thing that looks like it showed up all at once without history, that's the mass-produced commodity. Perhaps it's no surprise, then, that the art market quickly embraced pop art as one more luxury object. Appropriation art, on the other hand, had a very different relationship to popular imagery. More like certain strands of Dada and surrealism, appropriation art sought to understand how images around us inform our psyche and provide a basis for collective life. Martha Rossler's House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home, used a technique similar to surrealist collage, inserting photographs from the Vietnam War into scenes of American domestic life. Both sets of images were taken from copies of Life. Rossler just reassembled what was already bound together in the magazine and what only a serious threshold for cognitive dissonance holds apart. Appropriation art also harkened back to the ready-made by highlighting how an artist's gesture of selection could confer value on the most mundane object. Like the ready-made, appropriation drew attention to the institutions whose operations depend on ideas of exceptionality and originality, even and especially in the face of total unoriginality. Appropriations by Sturdivant, who made perfect copies of artists' work, in the case of Warhol, actually borrowing his silk screens to get the job done, as well as those by Sherry Levine, compel viewers to question just what kind of value is added by a signature, and more importantly, what kinds of people have historically been authorized to sign works in the first place. Hint, hint, they've usually looked more like Walker Evans and Duchamp than Sherry Levine or Sturdivant. Indeed, countless creative achievements in our museums are considered anonymous, many of them seized from regions and social groups that have been denied recognition and representation. This is to say nothing of conventionally unauthored cultural contributions, from quilts to recipes to folk or blues songs. In his essay, The Death of the Author, the theorist Roland Barthes argued that writing contains many layers of association that can only be unified in the reader's experience of a text. This meant that the author had no particular authority over the meaning of a book, because anything she wrote existed in a web of connotations and cultural significance. To interpret a book or an artwork was therefore not to decode it, 
or to identify its definitive meaning, but to demonstrate how it functioned in this web of significance. Michel Foucault followed with his essay, What is an Author?, which argued that an author is actually just an organizing principle that allows us to group together a certain number of cultural objects. More importantly, it clarifies who did not make the work, impeding rather than helping along the free circulation and inventiveness of creative output. No less of a paradigm for the artistic genius than Pablo Picasso once said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. This is often taken to mean that great artists transform their influences into their own authentic and original inventions. But appropriation art turns this meaning on its head. Appropriation art asks us to recognize that so-called great artists manage to convince us that their works are authentic and original because society has already given them the power to be authentic and original for reasons that have little to do with genius and a lot to do with the structures of power that concerned Foucault. Yes, there are people who have done amazing things and gotten credit for it, and we're grateful for their work. But copying shows that the idea of the original originating genius is a myth. It shows that this myth is linked to the power of images themselves to determine what kinds of representation, visual as well as political, are made available in our societies. Appropriation art, while sometimes confounding and often contested, helps us see that the context of pictures is absolutely integral to their meaning. It reminds us that pictures don't just have histories, they exist in history. A copy, no matter how perfect, is never really the same as the original, since its context is always shifting. And since we exist in history, our perspective is always shifting too. When artists copy, we recognize that they're making fresh meanings through their interaction with signs and symbols and bits of information already out in the world, and that this work is never done, not for them and not for us. The art assignment is fun. All right, so now we're going to start looking through at some work. Um, but I really like that video, of, um, you know, for many reasons, but I enjoy that they bring in um, Bars and Foucault, kind of their literary um, expertise in questioning, um, you know, the, the role of the reader and the role of, of the author as well. And um, I think that Foucault would be really proud of current generations. Um, and the kind of open source movement. He really was questioning structures of power and the death of the author. And um, so if, uh, you know, if you're into kind of literary um, or philosophy, uh, that those might be some good sources of inspiration to look at. Um, but we gotta go back and also take a look at Marcel Duchamp. And, <clears throat> the ready-made um, you know he's most known for the ready-made and it's uh it's it's funny because he created he was a working artist for 40 years and he created 13 of them so it wasn't really his main occupation but it probably was his greatest contribution to the art world because remember he wasn't um really concerned with the idea of um how to be a better artist but more the question of what it is to be an artist right um, so just a couple kind of um, looks back at these original um, kind of controversial appropriation pieces. Right. Uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, who we've looked at before, appropriating right, the, the candy. So in this case, there's little um, to no uh, kind of, uh, <clears throat> He didn't change the original object at all, right? Um, but the weight of the candy is the weight of his um, boyfriend uh, or partner, Ross, right? His healthy body weight before contracting AIDS. Um, so it's still significant uh, in the way that he arranges it. So this, uh, Richard Prince, uh, he was kind of mentioned as the, uh, <laughs> The, he's like the reigning champ of copy, copydom is kind of the way they said it. And this is definitely where I think many of us will disagree on what's uh, okay or not, right? On the left, we see the Marlboro um, commercial or, or uh, ad, I should say. Um, and these shoots were really pretty involved um, to get the to get these, uh, there was uh, a lot of money put in time and effort put into getting really beautiful Western 
cowboy um, shots to kind of endorse Marlboro. And at this time, Marlboro was trying to kind of uh, promote the filtered cigarette. And before that, everything had been like hand rolled. And so they wanted the filtered cigarette to be something that's like kind of just as, um, you know, pardon the term, but manly, right? They wanted it to be just still, still kind of tough, like cool thing. Um, and so that, that launched a, a fairly massive advertising campaign in the, just the kind of idealism of the American West as uh, something that's, you know, the, the frontier, right? And Richard Prince would just look at all these and then take a photo of the photo, quite simply, and blow them up and display them. So he, it's really removing the advertisement and questioning, um, you know, questioning the role of the advertising in, in pop culture and society and questioning the way that you can reframe something to, to make it your own, right? It also kind of begs the question of, is the advertisement even art itself because it's being created for a very specific purpose? You know, the, um, the original photographers, um, they don't own these images, although they're very, uh, upset and kind of offended um, with Richard Prince because they, in their minds, he, he stole their photograph, right? Um, but the only reason he was willing, able to do that was because they didn't own the photograph to begin with. So it brings up the, some kind of complicated questions and um, courts have actually ruled in favor of Richard Prince at times um, on this subject, but not without um, some kind of dismay. And if this is uh, kind of something you're interested in, I really ask that you Google Marlboro Cowboy and Richard Prince, and there's some pretty excellent videos of um, both sides, right, uh, of the photographers who had their work taken, um, and then Richard Prince's side. And he says, yeah, I took the photograph. I literally took the photograph. Right, so just kind of even playing with that language. Um, Walker Evans and Sherry Levine, this is a very similar um, case as well. And Sherry Levine's really questioning uh, the fact that everyone, all of the artists at the time that were taking these photos of the depression were, uh, you know, largely male. Right? This one's going to be the one that we're all familiar with um, for the most part anyway. So the photo on the right is taken by the Associated Press and the photo on the left is taken by Shepard Ferry. And uh, Shepard Ferry made uh, quite a bit of money, right? He, and there is no kind of uh, credit to the original photographer, Manny Garcia, right? So th this is, you know, these, these past three are really, I'm asking you, you know, to kind of form an opinion on what you think is right and what's not. Um, if Shepard Ferry had, had gone to Manny Garcia and asked if he could use this image, would it be different? Or, uh, you know, on the other side of that, Shepard Ferry changed the image quite a bit, right? He kind of put his own, artistic uh, license to it, um, it that color palette the, that he often uses and references um, kind of Russian propaganda art is kind of his signature way of handling imagery, right? So where do you lie in this conversation, right? So Shepard Ferry ended up uh, paying uh, a pretty good kind of a pretty good sum to Manny Garcia when it was all said and done, but um, do you think that Shepard Ferry had every right to use this, or do you think that he violated and, and in some way took this photograph? The art world at, you know, the time when Andy Warhol was taking these Campbell soups were outraged, like how could this be art, right? 
Um, but now I think many of us just kind of take it for granted. You see Campbell Soup Can, it's like, it's almost synonymous with Andy Warhol. And that video kind of talked about how um, it wasn't, Andy Warhol really believed that it wasn't the artist's job to come up with new images, right? And it's like repackaging what society had already approved. Um, and, had, you know, to the point that he called his studio a factory, he, he really thought that was good um, in trying to find a way to mass produce art so that it was, um, everyone could uh, access it. So I weigh away someone we're going to look at a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I just want to remind you that each one of these, if you want to use them as inspiration, I'm just asking that you look into them a little bit more. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, like, what, what does this piece, you know, mean to you just right away? Is this okay? Right. Um, that it's, he's really interested with um, how China, how society is shifting. Uh, how the handmade and crafted object isn't as valued in China anymore. And the, the mass production that China uh, is known for now has um, is really shifted when uh, the history of, of China is um, really in craftsmanship, right? And another Warhol, we've talked about this one a lot, but I just want to kind of remind um, the way that he reused stock imagery, right? And he did win uh, a contest for a portrait of Monroe, but it, it, he chose, he, he won the contest for actually, you know, a handmade um, drawing of Monroe, but he chose to reuse Monroe's stock images. And just because uh, we had a little Simpsons in the last lecture, I thought I'd throw this in as also. Banksy, right, and the David, um, known for a lot of really politically charged work um, and kind of the David and Goliath story, right, of David trying to take down Goliath and, and this like very kind of poignant moment beforehand and um, kind of repackaged as the suicide bomber here. Paulo Picasso's use of African masks and early cubism, um, highly critiqued, right, for cultural appropriation. Um, and and uh, a style that's not used uh, or not embraced uh, as much today, but uh, another kind of form of maybe how we appropriate ideas or imagery. I shop, therefore I am, Barbara Kruger, thinking about, uh, you know, how in a commercial society, sometimes our um, personal worth or uh, how it's measured may be connected to the things that we buy, right? Kind of thinking back and harping back on that phrase, I think, therefore I am. Kind of wily, we've talked about uh, a couple times in class and he's, you know, one of the, one of the masters of this uh, as being accepted into the academy, right? Uh, into major museums and, and really questioning the role of history painting and the and the propaganda um, that it had, and then really illuminating what it is to be, uh, you know, the young black youth in America today, and that's um, something that he finds very important in putting them in, um, you know, very noble uh, paintings. Right. Another example here. This one's new to me, but it is very uh, timely in terms of the coronavirus. It just feels right to see that empty Last Supper. Um, but again, it's kind of questioning um, the time period in which in which these are made, uh, and in kind of the the context, right? And, and he's simply removing them, and and sometimes there's this really kind of eerie ghostly shadow left behind in some of the pieces. Tara Donovan is someone who uses uh, pretty common household objects and unlike Duchamp, she does uh, kind of put them into a new form. I guess you could argue Duchamp put the bicycle wheel and the stool into a new form. Um, but there's uh, maybe a little bit more manipulation here in terms of you can't exactly tell what the objects are 
um, but the objects themselves, in this case the styrofoam cups, are largely un, uh, unchanged, right? Some of them you see are a little smushed more than others. I haven't been able to find much on this work, but I think it's a great example of appropriation, right? Taking something that already exists and uh, just kind of changing the form, but not the actual object. And then we have kind of assemblage, more like ready-made style art as well. Frame of mind. I've seen a lot of this kind of stuff um, crop up with personal objects uh, in this moment in, <laughs> in quarantine. I, I've noticed a lot of photographers who are um, arranging, um, you know, maybe their bedside table in an interesting way, or um, all of their objects in their house by color. Uh, monochromatic compositions or complementary or triads, for example. Uh, there's been kind of a, a lot of different uh, quarantine compositions, as I would kind of call them. I've just been noticing on Instagram that have been fairly interesting. In the case of uh, Paul Soldner, really appropriating a traditional technique, and I think this is something that we see in art a lot, and not quite as controversial, um, but still some people, uh, you know, at, at the core of appropriation, there's usually some, someone who's upset or offended. And there has been some, there was, um, I should say, some critique on this. The Japanese tradition of Raku um, was uh, an emperor, really, was really fancy, really fancied it. And the idea was that these pots would come hot out of the kiln with, and they sprinkle some tea in there and pour the water in. Um, so the, the heat from the cup was actually steeping the tea and it was like a ceremony. Um, what they didn't know at the time was that it, this technique is really toxic. And so it was actually <laughs> killing the wealthy, um, which is slightly ironic. But um, Paul Stillner then took this t technique into the vessel and, uh, and he, he spent some quite a bit of time out here in Colorado. Um, Aspen, you come through. I know he stopped in Gunnison. He went to Adams State, did some did some work on his way down to New Mexico. Um, so he's a somewhat kind of local. Uh, he spent some time locally. I wouldn't call him local, but um, he really brought this technique back um, into the ceramic world. And if you've ever taken a raku or taken like an intro to ceramics or, um, you know, at your local art center, raku is still really popular, uh, popular workshop because it's, you know, pretty instant and, uh, and fun. Ai Weiwei, again, um, this is the work called Straighten. We saw it real briefly this semester already. But uh, there was an earthquake that um, it, it devastated some areas of China. And he went in and took all the rebar and, and painstakingly straightened it and displayed it in the gallery. And Ai Weiwei is also someone who's controversial because um, he doesn't really... He, he's like a conceptual art, artist in the sense that he prizes the idea, right? He's not often the one, he's not straightening every single one of these pieces of rebar, right? He's having uh, studio assistants, he's paying people to do it. And so this is also where um, I want you to kind of think about, you know, where do you see art happening? Is it in the process of making? Is it in the idea? Is it in the mind of the viewer, um, right? So this is, those are kind of important questions that I just ask that you think of and, and kind of maintain a critical eye when you're looking at work. Um, you don't have to always, you know, say the same thing either. It's, it's totally okay to kind of ebb and flow with where this line is for you. Another um, Ai Weiwei, and uh, looking again at the, the shift in um, commuter traffic. A, a lot of Chinese people used to commute by bike um, to work and there's been a big shift into motor vehicles and mopeds and, and stuff like that. Um, so he's like kind of gathered a lot of these old bikes that are being abandoned um, and, and examining that shift. 
And then here's another uh, installation style, the same um, concept. Right? And then one more by Iwayway because um, he's just one of the kind of foremost uh, artists of this style right now. But uh, all these three legged wooden stu stools used to be a real kind of cornerstone in a Chinese household. And they've been kind of replaced with a more mass produced plastic stool. And so he has kind of been collecting these and then um, hiring um, artists that are um, traditional woodworkers to join them together with traditional um, Chinese joining techniques. So just a few student examples uh, as well, just to kind of um, help you move along because this will be a project, um, appropriation project for you all. And one uh, student was really inspired by the Marlboro Man and uh, did the research to find right that uh, what the kind of campaign was about and he was looking ahead uh, what we are uh, killing ourselves with today right so the the jewel um, something he said he might do differently is he's just looking at the advertising style of the jewel and how it's like really poppy really bright colors to kind of you know, attract kids and so he thought maybe you know this piece could be enhanced with uh, with some more color maybe you have maybe you have some ideas for it too I don't know uh, we have a nice composition here the creation of Adam and um, what this art what the student called the creation of Kanye and tacos All right so kind of tongue-in-cheek pretty funny um, but uh, you know, well thought out. Two things that this uh, this student really loved: Kanye and tacos. He did a couple other projects around uh, around tacos. So, and Invader, someone we'll see real soon in uh, Mexican muralism, the evolution of street art um, lecture. And the student really liked the tile work and how he was just like uh, putting these up out out in the world and. Um, because, you know, I, I don't want to lose my job for you um, putting some, some work up in uh, public space. He um, put it on a piece of masonite and uh, kind of what he, he called, I'm invading invaders style. Right? So he used the tile as inspiration and, and painted each one and mounted it into his own composition. So just a few ideas. I encourage you to take it any, any direction you want to. And um, I'll be asking you also to include just a short statement on a written response saying, um, you know, where you stand with appropriation art, what you think of it. Um, and just remember, there's no wrong answer. Just want to hear what you have to say. So hopefully you can get going on some thumbnails or thinking about what you want, want to do for your appropriation project. Thanks.